Dragon's Dogma 2 is the long-awaited sequel to an unpolished and heavily flawed masterpiece. The first game has outdated graphics, unrefined open-world design, and mostly mundane quests. Yet, many people like myself tried it just a year ago and fell in love, testing the many different vocations, taking on the UR Dragon, and the many dangers in the Everfall, inevitably heading over to Bitter Black Isle to endlessly grind Daemon for that top-tier loot. Even with the game being so flawed, it always pulled you back in with that combat, because at the end of the day, fighting big monsters in creative ways never gets old. Does Dragon's Dogma 2 live up to the first game? Does it improve on the combat, quests, and world design? Is it a good sequel? Well, I have officially put in over 100 hours, fully leveling every vocation, scouring the entire endgame for gear and new opponents to fight, and here is what I think. Let's start off with the most important aspect of any video game, the gameplay. And to sum it up simply, you're going to be fighting large monsters. The entire idea of this game is to start you off with nothing but rags, and somehow you make something of yourself, ending up with shiny armor and the most powerful weapons in the world. On your journey, you solve quests for both regular old people of the town and commanders of the Royal Guard. You level up with pretty much every action, so it's going to be easier to take on the next foe each time you meet them. With unique mechanics such as climbing monsters, making bridges out of monsters, freezing enemies, throwing pawns, and creating a team of four unique classes that can take on anything. You can choose from a selection of vocations of classes and each changes up your playstyle by a lot. You've got Thief with fast and agile daggers, you have Warrior with the big bonk brain that staggers things easily, then you've got the OP magic with sorcerer and insane support with a mage. You can choose to play as all of these throughout even a single playthrough so you can just have fun trying things out and seeing what fits for you. Then your pawns also get a variety of vocations. All of the pawns get less options as they can't be the more flashy mixed vocations, those being Mystic Spearhand, Trickster, Warfarer, and Magic Archer. Now, you get one main pawn who sort of acts as a secondary character for you. You're going to level her, choose her gear and vocation, but an AI is going to play for her. Then you can opt to bring along two other pawns people on the server have made. If you've got friends with the game, you can actually select their pawns and thus play indirect co-op in a single player game. And this gets real fun with, say, you as a warrior for damage, having a mage pawn to be the ultimate support, and then bring along a sorcerer and archer to round out your team. The goal is to take down the biggest monster you can with the perfect team composition. Which means this game offers unlimited playtime because you can always switch pawns, equipment, and skills to make any encounter something brand new. And well, the gameplay is perfect. There's an endless amount of fun to be had because like I mentioned earlier, enemy encounters are wildly different. The environment itself might change how you deal with the same opponent. It being nighttime might actually bring to life new enemies altogether. And you can even abuse the brine in the water to swallow griffins for free. The endless lust for the next big monster fight makes this game an absolute blast start to finish. Plus, this game actually lets you get to be a powerhouse. There's no balance in this game. You can straight up be overpowered with anything you want because it's fun to deal all of a dragon's health in a single attack. So the vocations are your classes that you're going to choose from. These have been heavily toned down from the first game, but still have their own individual flair to them. None of the classes have two weapons this time around. Before you had Strider with a bow and daggers, or Mystic Knight with a magic shield and mace. Now each class gets one weapon besides Fighter, which is sword and board, but even then the shield's less of a weapon now. Archer feels like a real archer now. You can't use daggers anymore, and instead rely on long-range attacks. When things get too close to you, kick up into the air and move out so your pawns can cover you. Fighter is the look at me class. Since he can reliably avoid damage through blocks, you want to keep enemy attention and stay alive. But this doesn't mean he can't deal damage because several of his moves stop attacks with zero effort or allow for constant stagger over a long period. Mage has been greatly improved in this sequel as it is one of the best support classes in a video game ever. They gave it a way to cure debilitation, free healing for the team at any time, access to all the elements for your team in the form of boons, a massive dome that grants infinite stamina to everyone, and even a speed boost. You could get away with not running a mage in the first game pretty easily, but in this one it feels required to have a mage pawn because they offer so much. Still not much of a class you're going to want to play as the Arisen since it is mainly support. 
Thief is the Strider and Assassin classes from the first game, but this time no bow. So now you need to rely on quick attacks and dodges to get in and out of danger quickly. Mystic Spearhand is the closest thing we have to Mystic Knight from the first game, although there is definitely no replacing that awesome class. This is the new mixed vocation that fits very well. Super flashy moves with a twin blade that has you moving quickly and honestly doing some pretty cool stuff with his skills. Magic Archer is Magic Archer from before, but no daggers, and sadly they gave it no way to avoid damage at all. You do output very, very high damage from far away, making the class an absolute powerhouse, but it's more of a glass cannon so you're going to need a good team, otherwise you'll get hurt often. Sorcerer is Sorcerer, the most absurd magic attacks you've ever seen that make every encounter trivial. Meteors, earthquakes, tornadoes, I think you get the idea. It's what a sorcerer who spends all his time studying ancient tomes should be. Trickster, who's the pure support class with no way to deal damage. This will force you to buff your pawns, distract the enemy, and think tactfully for the win. It is very strong, potentially, but sadly, it is the most boring class in the game. You have absolutely no way to deal any damage, so it just isn't as fun as anything else. Cool idea, but it could have been so much more, and the fact that we get this and not Mystic Knight is a travesty. Warrior, who got the biggest upgrade from the first game. This guy was really tough because he had less than every other class, but in this sequel, he's arguably one of the best classes, nearly immune to damage and stagger while taking out huge health bars in a single hit. Some of the highest stagger potential you're going to get, all while easily hitting enemy weak points and feeling like a beast while doing it. And then there is the Warfarer, which is the Jack of All Trades. He gets the best augment in the game, as well as a skill to swap to any weapon in an instant. So you can play all of your favorite vocations at the same time, pretty much. Really cool idea, and I'd say properly balanced too, since you can't use all of the skills at once. All of these vocations get four total skill slots, which we got six in the first game. It's just a different design choice that they went with. If you want to use something different, you can always switch at town or buy a campsite, so it doesn't really hinder you at all. A new mechanic added into this game was the introduction of master skills. Basically, there's one NPC out in the world somewhere who's mastered a vocation. If you prove your worth to them, they'll grant you a scroll that teaches you a master skill from your class. For example, if you find a little girl in the woods early on in the game, you can hand her five grimoires. She gives you a sorcerer skill. Her grandma gives you a mage skill, and her dad can give you the other sorcerer skill if you give him the same grimoires. All classes have a master skill, with some like the thief and sorcerer getting two, because they're cool, I guess. And the only distinction between these and regular skills is that the Warfarer class can't use them. So if you want to be jack of all trades, you can't be a master of any of them. But this system is actually a great addition to the game. You're rewarded heavily for interacting with people around the world and assisting them with their dilemmas. It's completely optional and very much not required to beat the game. But do so and you do get the best skills in the game, by far. The one for Thief literally makes you unkillable, so these are very much worth your time to go and get. And what's really cool is that that pawns can use these as well, meaning you're going to need to get several if not all of the master skills in order to have them when either of you need them. An excellent mechanic added into the game because being rewarded for your efforts is a huge incentive to play a video game in the first place. The open world is by far one of the biggest improvements from the first game. In the first one, you have grassy hillside or misty forest, and you never ever needed to go to the forest at all, really meaning everything was grass or more grass. Well now you've got a large forest area, a desert, this short volcanic area, and mountains everywhere. Heck, the misty area even made a return, although now it's kind of a land of the dead type of thing. You start out in the grassy forest where goblins roam free and bandits try to pick your pocket. You move up into the elven territory which is more dense and maze-like, fighting ogres and such. You can make your way up to a battleground area with this crumbling castle, finding a sphinx who offers riddles which is sort of the most mountainous area in the game. Directly under this is, well, essentially a hole in the earth. Surrounded by mountains, it's impossible to navigate and filled with the dead. Liches, skeletons, wisps, and the actual undead are everywhere, and as far as I know, there's never any reason to come here. Just pure exploration. Moving on into the massive desert, things get very interesting, because here you're going to need to explore thoroughly as to not miss caves hiding, say, a Medusa, many garm that are known as wargs in this game, chomping on some lost dogs, and surprise, there are a few dragons lurking around. My favorite idea here was the 
the system of ropes that you can travel on. You hop in a small wooden platform and start turning the wheel. It's going to take you to like a central hub where you can then get on another platform to travel in several different directions, letting you skip all of the dangerous forks and curves that the normal road down below has. Doesn't even need to be used really, but offers more to the world design for sure. After scraping your way through a dangerous cavern, you come out on the other side to a volcanic region. And I'm telling you, this world is incredibly dense. Sometimes you might be begging to stop fighting things because around every corner is just more and more. This world is far more interesting to explore than the first, and the more you get to know the landscape, the faster you can find bigger and more interesting monsters to fight. Enemy variety has been bashed a bit with this game as people seem to think there are only about 5 total enemy types, which you do fight the same enemies a lot so it's not perfect by any means, but it'd be a lie to say that enemy variety isn't good. There are so many different things to fight, griffins in fact are much more prevalent as you have one per region, and you can even get into their nests which makes for cool moments. Goblins, bandits, saurians, cyclopses, and minotaurs roam around the first area. In the desert we see war Medusa, Chimeras, different Harpies, Poison and Lightning Saurians. Then in the Volcanic area you've got these Hobgoblins, Lava Saurians, Succubi, and Lava Slimes. There are of course dragons or more accurately drakes in different locations all over the map. You fight headless horsemen during the night, but wait, there's even more. In the end game, the entire world changes. Gore Chimera come out to play, more dangerous dragons appear, purple ghasts everywhere, and the undead skeletons, liches, and zombies scour the earth. Yes, I'm not going to argue that the enemy variety isn't a bit thin in certain areas, but you play this game fully and you honestly can't tell someone the enemy variety is bad, because there are so many different things to fight, which is the fun part of the game. Now, they did exclude Hydras and the Floating Eyes for some reason. Cool enemies just not in this sequel, but again, it's not the same game, so no reason to really expect everything to be the same. And another issue people always bring up is reskins, because goblins and saurians are quote unquote reskinned multiple times in this game. And while this is true, you've got like small green goblins, red goblins, skinny axe wielding goblins, then there's the lava, water, rock, poison, and lightning saurians. You begin to go, oh boy, this again. But at the same time, each enemy behaves differently, has different attacks and different weaknesses. So finding the one cave with electric saurians in it was still pretty cool because they weren't at all the same enemy as the regular ones earlier on in the game. Or you might have the slimes that can be instantly exploded with fire, then becoming lava slimes later on. Enemy variety is definitely not this game's biggest strength, but it does still have a lot to offer. If you're getting bored fighting the same stuff, go find different stuff. They're out there, trust me. Another new mechanic in this sequel is the introduction of the Dragon's Plague. What happens is, is your pawns can be affected by this dragon disease either through fighting dragons or contracting it from other pawns. Your followers start to become more agitated and less agreeable with you as the disease progresses. Eventually, they're going to disagree with your commands altogether and have red glowing eyes. If you happen to sleep in a town with one of these pawns in your party, they turn into a dragon in the middle of the night and kill every NPC in that town. Does not matter how many pawns you have, doesn't matter how many NPCs there are or what town you're in. Don't catch this in time and every NPC will die. Now there are ways to fix this, which is by sleeping 10 days most of the time. NPCs are going to respawn to take over shops and wander the cities. However, essential NPCs such as main quest givers do not respawn. You're forced to use a wake stone to revive them or miss out on that quest. Ultimately, this mechanic isn't all that bad and you can fix your your mistake if you need to. Also, the very end of the story after Endgame explains this phenomenon some more, which does help to give it a place in the game. But I think it's kind of a big missed opportunity. So the ideal way to avoid this is just to never sleep in town. Yeah, you're going to sleep in camps instead and never worry about it. Or if you really have to sleep in town, you're going to kill all of your pawns by throwing them into the water and sleep before resummoning them. What it does is slow down the gameplay for no real reason and it's tedious. Plus, this could have been so much more. Imagine if this still happened, but when your pawn transforms, you have to fight them. Manage to defeat the dragified pawn and you're rewarded with some worm fire crystals and no one in the town dies. Fail and then the whole town suffers. That would have consequences for your actions instead of, oh crap, I forgot to kill my pawns, now I'm a bit doomed. 
Dragon's Plague, I think, is fine story-wise, but gameplay-wise, it's a hindrance which just is there to hurt your progression. So this new world also has a pretty significant mechanic that completely transforms it into something else from the first. When you take damage, some of your health disappears for good, giving you some white health which can be healed and the rest cannot. Stay out in combat too long and eventually your items and mages cannot heal you past a certain point. This was kind of in the first game, as mages could only heal up to your white health, I believe, but potions would cure everything else. So what seemed like the ideal way to play, or what I did usually, is stock up on 80 Harspud potions, and now you've got infinite health and stamina for the rest of the game. Well, it's not really a balanced or good mechanic, so they tried to get rid of it. Instead, now you have to eventually stop combat and rest before the next engagement. And thankfully, they put campfires all over the world. At these essentially check Checkpoints, you can stop and get a bite to eat, which offers significant buffs to you for the next day, having this fun cooking animation, and then head to bed. In the morning or nighttime, whichever you choose to wake up at, you have full health back. To do this, you're going to require a camp set which weighs a lot. Pawns are still glorified backpacks, thankfully, and so make them hold these always. Additionally, you may want a backup campsite because enemies can invade you during your rest. More advanced tents can prevent this or even be given back to you still, but the basic ones are going to break when this happens. And this entire mechanic turns Dragon's Dogma 2 into a more of a, say, D&D experience. You and your party go out on adventures, completing quests and fighting dragons, eventually reaching a point where you're out of hit points and need to regain your strength. Talk around the campfire for a bit, rest, and then continue on. I actually really hated the health mechanic at first, but the entire campfire part really fits well and gets rid of the take infinite potions into combat problem that the first game had. Oh, and all of the unlocked skills can be changed at these campsites, letting you change your setup if you happen to know your next opponent doesn't work well with your current skills. Hence why they decreased the skill amount, I would assume. Now it's time to talk about the quests. And while I love this game and think a lot of the aspects are a 10 out of 10, sadly, the quest design, with that in mind, gets a 0 out of 10. I've never, ever seen such outdated and terrible quest design in my life. This is actually worse than the first game by a long shot. Every single quest in this game is either a fetch quest or an escort. Every single one. Both of which take forever and are really boring to complete. Plus, the game is constantly sending you in the general direction of your objective but never actually showing you the exact location, making things incredibly frustrating at times. The real problem is that all these quests have you talk to an NPC, do something, and then come back. But before you can get the next quest step, they need time to do something for that quest. So what seems like the ideal way to play this game is to sleep a full day after every single quest step. NPCs are constantly wanting you to talk to them, teleport across the entire world, complete something, and teleport back. But with the fairy stones working the way they are, you really won't be able to do this, or won't want to, so you can save them for later on. Meaning for quests, you're going to walk back and forth wasting hours of real world time, when all they really had to do was give you the next quest step. And don't even get me started on the end game stuff, the quests over there are 10 times worse than that of the main game. I had to actually go up to the main castle and talk to the prince. The prince then sent me to the bar to talk to the captain. The captain then sent me back to the prince. The prince then sent me to his mom to bring him back to the prince. Then sending me down to the stables so I could walk back up to the prince. I had to walk back and forth through a massive city probably 7 times to complete a single quest. No fighting in between and nothing interesting happening. These quests actually get so bad that you're going to stop caring about the dialogue at all because you're ready to just be fighting stuff again. The master skill quests can be fun, but even those have you travel back and forth a little too much. Now we do get a really cool character known as the Sphinx. This is like a more unique griffin who gives you riddles instead of fighting. I love this character and really enjoyed the idea. Problem is, even this was just more fetch quests. You've got to teleport to and from her location in between all five steps, and then do it all over again once she moves to another location. At least these ones were unique and offered cool rewards, but it turned a really, really cool experience into a massive chore that I had to stare at a guide for. I really hate to say it, but for a lot of people, the quests will actually ruin this game for you. There are a few that are cool, like using a cat mask to sneak through the border gate or copying a special jewel so two merchants can each have one. But then someone's going to ask you to escort them around the map for the 80th time and you start losing your mind. 
Don't design fetch quests like this. Don't design escort quests ever. Both are just bad in general, and even worse when they're repeated over and over. As for the story, I actually really liked this one. The first game had a great story overall, although it was lost by most people as it was not well explained hardly at all. It was just really confusing. This one, however, is very simple. The Arisen can control pawns. Other greedy people want this ability, as that would obviously be very useful. So they use these dark red crystals taken from the dead souls of past Arisens and try to summon a dragon to change the world. It all goes wrong and you try to get your heart back. Super easy to follow and gives you something to snap back to in between all the other activities. What a lot of people missed is that at the end of the story, it's not actually the end. Once you get to the end game, you need to use God's Bane in yourself while riding the dragon for a secret end game. And there you're gonna get the actual story. Like they explain everything. Dragon's Plague, the brine being overpowered, swallowing even dragons, your connection to the world, and how it's all a cycle. And there seems to be an actual happy ending, which is really cool. This is the kind of game that seems very shallow story-wise, but it's probably because you missed the actual ending. I know I did the first time around, as it's really easy to miss and just go straight to NG+, by accident, instead of the actual end game. Speaking of the end game, I do want to mention that it is amazing. I was actually told by several people that it wasn't worth the time and that I should skip it. Not really sure why they said this, because this is where the most fun can be had. Now, it isn't perfect, and I already mentioned that the bad quest design gets even worse there, but there is so much fighting to be had. All of the spots in the map that had water now don't. Your job is to explore every inch of these newly uncovered areas. There, you're going to find new enemies enemies, much tougher dragons, many more night creature enemies making the headless horsemen way more common, and even special loot. Yes, there are hidden chests all over the new areas that grant the strongest armor in the game, and all you do is fight stuff which is absurdly fun. Now this unfortunately comes with two different problems. Number one, your time here is limited, because you need to destroy the three laser beams quickly or I guess the world gets taken over. But even once that threat is cleared, you can't stay here forever because campsites no longer longer work. The mechanic that lets you restore all of your health, yeah, that doesn't work anymore. So after you use up your 10 days at the inn, you're just kind of screwed. Either use wake stones to revive, apparently switch classes to get your health back, or simply move on. It's almost as if they don't want you to be in endgame very long. But that's kind of weird because endgame is supposed to be the, oh, just go fight big monsters. Explore all the new stuff and then get out of there, I guess. I actually do think this was better than the Everfall in the first game, because while that was kind of awesome, there was way too many wasted doors that didn't have bosses. It should have just been all boss doors over and over since that was the fun part. This here is actually just boss fight after boss fight at times, and with some good loot to get as well. Overall, the end game has some very questionable decisions, but still offers a lot to the player with some pretty cool and unique battles for the story as well. So there are also some other things I wanted to talk about here but didn't really have a category for. My number one complaint is that they screwed up the stamina system in this game big time. Stamina actually drains slower when you're going uphill which is really annoying and it comes back slower when you're going uphill as well. And for some reason the biggest complaint in the first game which was not having unlimited stamina when just running around the world, they didn't change this. You still waste stamina when running. It's understandable why they didn't do that but at the same time it's like this is a quality of life thing we really needed. Microtransactions ruin the game! Yeah, well, there are no microtransactions. All the stuff you buy is useless. It's not even thrown in your face. Microtransactions are only bad when they provide such a high incentive to use them that you're forced to purchase to play the game. For example, let's say the best weapon in this game is through a microtransaction. Well, guess what? That is predatory and bad. Microtransactions are almost always bad in PvP games because they usually provide an advantage for players who have them versus those who don't. But in PvE games, especially ones like this where you just play solo, they're a way for companies to make money off of lazy people while not doing anything to harm the average player's experience. And from my experience, I've had almost no performance issues in this game since the beginning. I've played since day one until now and nothing really. The main town had FPS drops, but that got patched immediately. Other than that, my game runs fine on my decent PC as long as I modified the settings to match my specifications. 
Pawn AI has been greatly improved. So well, in fact, that you can rely on pawns to do everything they should be doing in every fight. And if by chance they don't, your commands are instantly met, which is really nice. Only issue is they love to jump off cliffs for some reason. It's actually quite common in certain areas. Port crystals and fast travel were kind of a mess up, because port crystals are fine as you use them to create travel points around the world. The real issue is the fairy stones. They should have just given us the eternal one. They knew that was the way to fix fast travel in the first game, why try this again? I mean, you can buy fairy stones at the apothecary shops, but it's just unnecessary. Especially early on, it forces you to walk everywhere. The carts are actually a cool way to fast travel, as you get monster fights during their rides sometimes, but this just feels like a step back for no real reason. We all know that teleporting directly to where bosses would be over and over sounds way more fun. And lastly, the character's lip sync is off, as in they're gonna just move their mouths without following the words. If that bothers you, it is here, although it really doesn't affect gameplay, so it doesn't matter that much. All things considered, I personally would give this game an 8 out of 10, which oddly enough is what I would rank the first game, so they're pretty much equal. The addition of unique weapons in certain places, a much more interesting world to explore, and every monster actually being able to be fought several times over is a great improvement. I think the game needs more, particularly another BBI situation where that really rounded out the game with endless content. Right now, there's no reason to continue leveling up as you don't need to be stronger than level 50 to beat anything. But apparently from what I've heard you can get up to level 999? I mean I don't have proof of this because I haven't seen it but that feels pretty excessive. The quest design and expensive fairy stones hinder this game more than it should but the core combat is as good as it ever was and well worth your time if you like a true RPG or at least just enjoyed the first one. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and if so a like down below would be appreciated. Thanks for watching everybody, and I'll catch you next time.